नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम अगेन टू दिस एवर लास्टिंग जर्नी ऑफ इंडियन डांस यू हैव बीन इन दिस क्लास एंड गॉन थ्रू मैनी मैनी एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ इंडियन डांस स्पेशली भारतनाट्यम विच वी हैव बीन टॉकिंग अबाउट टूडे वी टेक अप द इम्पॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट ऑफ वेर वी लेफ्ट द लास्ट टाइम ऑफ द आर्ट ऑफ द देवदास इन द टेम्पल्स वी लर्न हाउ द देवदास इज परफॉर्म्ड ट्रेंड एंड प्रमोटेड एन आर्ट फॉर्म टूडे we specifically take up the forms of dance in other parts of india's like in east in odisha mohris and in north and central india notch mohris were a class of dancers in eastern india dedicated to singing and dancing for gods as one of the 64 forms of worshiping at puri jagannath temple and the big lingaraj temple complex in odisha the practice arose out of benevolent expansion under ganga dynasty kings from 12th century onwards the earliest reference to the dedication of dancing girls in odisha is in the form of an inscription belonging to the time of odyota kesari king in the 9th century ad the king's mother kulavati devi dedicated temple dancers to lord shiva in brahmeshwar temple bhubaneswar the earliest performers of odissi were these dancers and they continued to be its chief repositories for centuries so the history of odissi dance is largely the history of these devdasis or maharis as they are called as they are known in odisha the kesari period saw the decline of buddhism and ascendancy of brahmanism in odisha this in a way paved the way for emergence of the jagannath cult or recognition of vishnu krishna as lord of the world and he was to play a vital role in the shaping of the dance tradition of the maharis after the kesaris the ganga dynasty came to power chodaganga 1077 to 1147 began construction of the jagannath temple at puri and also employed maharis for service in this temple in 1194 ananga bhima deva became the ruler he built several temples and constructed the hall of dance the nata mandir as an annex to the jagannath temple for performance of the maharis and musicians who were in the service of the temple celebrated composer jaydev lived at this time and his geet govind later became an indispensable part of the rituals at jagannath temple towards the close of the ganga rule king raj raj deva appointed about 20 dancing girls for service in the jagannath temple in 1435 kapilend deva established the rule of surya vamsa solar dynasty he introduced the custom of having the mahari dance twice a day at jagannath temple once at the time of bhog lord's midday meal and at the time of bara shringar lord's ritual adornment before being put to bed he also started the tradition of having the geet govinda sung every day as part of the temple's daily rituals kapil indra dev's son purushottama deva defeated narasimha salva of kanchipuram and married his daughter Rupa Ambika who was renamed Padmavati of her own accord Padmavati enlisted herself as a mahari and the temple honored her with the Gopasadi award for her services as a dancer in the Jagannath temple the temple chronicle Madala Panji records the act this suggests that maharis were held in respect at that time and that a woman considered it a great honor to be permitted to serve the lord as a dancing girl reference to dance rituals at jagannath temple can be found in the skanda purana 10th and 11th century ad after purushottama deva died in 1497 his son pratap rudra deva ruled that only geet govinda should be sung in jagannath temple Ramananda Patnaik the governor of Rajendri met Saint Chaitanya who lived around this time and relinquishing his post lived in the service of Jagannath at Puri 
He is credited with having introduced Abhinaya in the dance of the Maharis and was also the first to engage them to take part in drama. Till then, the performers in dramas had been exclusively men and boys. Ramananda Patnaik wrote the Jagannath Ballava, a beautiful synthesis of poetry, music and dance. The Maharis of Jagannath Temple assumed the dancing and singing roles in the play which was staged in the temple in the presence of the king. The word Mahari had several connotations. Some say it is Mahari Nari, great woman. Others opine the name could have been derived from Maha Prasadi or sacred offering, Maharani or the principal queen. Scholar Sadashiv Ratasarma opines the word Mahari must have been derived from the word Mahanagari. According to Sloka of Atharva Veda, professional dancers were called Mahanagari. When Jagannath temple became the matrix of the religious and cultural life of Odisha, the role of the Maharis in the daily rituals and festivals is clearly defined. It is said that in the 12th century, King Chodaganga Deva established seven colonies for temples adjacent to the temple and these place allotted to the Maharis were known as Anga Alasa Patna, the place of bodily gestures. Maharis are the holy brides of Lord Jagannath. A piece of cloth is taken and tied around the idol, around the head of the dancer also by the temple priest to symbolize her marriage to the deity of the shrine. Maharis are vowed to chastity and their sacred duties and daily life are supervised by the Meena Nayak and Sahi Nayak, temple servants appointed by the king. A valuable manuscript Niladri Archana Chandrika written by a Mahari of Jagannath temple describes the ritual dances of the Maharis and their daily life and customs. Only a Devdasi who stayed faithful to a lord up to end had the privilege of having a body after death covered with the same sari she received during the ritual of the marriage with Jagannath and having the embers for the cremation brought from the temple itself. Maharis are richly attired for temple service. After bathing, fragrant sandalwood paste is applied to the body. A colorful silk sari of traditional pattern is draped around the body and tied at the waist. The face is decorated with the sacred tilak mark between the brows and delicate pattern of white dots applied above the brows and on the cheeks. Fingertips, palms and feet are tinted crimson and eyes are lined black with colorium or kajal. The hair is parted and knotted in a chignon wreath with flowers and adorned with golden curved disc pierced with a peg ivory of gold. Beautiful gold ornaments decorate the head, neck, arms, ears, waist and ankles. Covering her head with a veil, the Mahari goes to the temple, accompanied by the Meena Nayak. She is escorted to the inner shrine by the Rajguru, who bears a gold-mounted st staff as a symbol of the king's authority. He is always present at the dance rituals. The Mahari bows first to the Lord, then to the Rajguru, before she begins to offer her prayers through dance. There are different types of Maharis according to their service. The Bhitar Gauni Mahari perform in the innermost sanctum, dance and sing at the time of Lord's ritual adornment before being put to bed. The Bahar Gani Maharis, though excluded from the sanctum sanctorum, perform in the Nata Mandir or near the Garuda pillar in the temple courtyard. Other temple servants who render daily service are the Gauriasnis, temple maids who fan the idol with chamaris, gitaganis or singers and musicians who play veena, drone instruments, drums, flutes, cymbals to accompany the dance. Early Maharis performed mainly nritta or pure dance and abhinaya which is interpretation of poetry based on mantras and slokas. Later Maharis specially performed dance sequences based on the lyrics of Jayadev's Geet Govinda. They were ordained to perform five times a day. 
the Mahari is performed during the nine days of the Rath Yatra, during June, July and during the birth anniversary of Lord Krishna celebrated at the Jagannath temple. These Maharis were part of pedigree and learning. According to temple records, there were 20 Maharis serving Lord Jagannath in the 15th century. Each dancer taking a turn in the daily rituals and all of them participating in religious festivals. There are 62 annual festivals in honor of Jagannath. And in two of these, the Maharis have an important part in the Chandan Yatra and Jolan Yatra. The Maharis as a community of Jagannath were exclusive teachers of their art. It was a custom for Maharis to adopt daughters and train them for dance service in the temple. Thus the dance retained its artistic purity and sanctity for at least 600 years. By the end of the 16th century, Orissa had lost her independence and came under rule successively of the Bohois, Pathans, Mughals, Marathas and finally the British. For over 300 years, the political condition of the region remained in turmoil, which affected the religious, social and cultural aspects of life. Many times during this period, the seva services to Lord Jagannath had to be suspended. After Odisha was annexed to the Mughal Empire of Akbar in 1592, Ram Deva, the Raja of Khurda, was appointed superintendent of the Jagannath Temple. The Maharis who were exclusively appointed to temple services were now employed to dance at the royal court of Khurda and from time on they lost their religious status. The Maharis ceased to be respected as servants of the Lord and came to be associated with the moral depravity. The Devdasi system suffered a grievous blow when royal patronage in the form of land grant etc. ended. Some Devdasi's families were forced to sell their rights to perform seva to others able and willing to pay. The transaction had to be registered with appropriate authorities. Once a Devdasi family sold its rights to another, it could not regain them. Another survival tactic employed by some was the sale within the precincts of temple itself of the prasad received by them. Yet many of the Devdasis could not survive with the proceeds of selling the prasad as their only income. Compelled by circumstances, they had to relinquish the Devdasi status and take to other service professions like nursing and teaching. Marriage to a mere mortal was another way out. Some of the last surviving Maharis known to as Haripiya, Shashimani, Kokila Prabhu and Parashmani. Kokila Prabhu used to sing Geet Govind every night at the temple to Jagannath at bedtime. After she died, the service was discontinued. Now there are no Maharis left to continue the rituals. The once vibrant Mahari tradition has gradually faded into oblivion and is already a thing of the past. Notch was a term the Britishers used as a colloquial for Natch to dance. Essentially, these were North and Central Indian dancers, not necessarily attached to temples like in South India. These were general entertainers who served the society in many ways, including serving men in the world's oldest profession. As they became slowly part of British or Mughal concubines, the term itself became derogatory. Notch girls were soon associated with houses of ill repute and Mughal etiquette and court culture combined with British prudery and Victorian morality didn't make it easy for such artists. They were relegated to low position in society and generally lived off rich patrons. Their training and upkeep was the charge of either someone employed by the nobility under whom they served or by the court. Many examples abound about this tradition and Lucknow, Meerut, Ambala, Banaras, Jaipur became the main centers. The Mughal courts also supported and slowly Hindu courts had such dancers too. 
Thus arose two distinct cultures, those supported by Lucknow and those supported by Jaipur. Thus two main styles of Kathak also got structured and named after these schools. Notch partook of Kathak loosely in stylings and moorings. Notch as dance form was not distinct, but an amalgamation of many North Indian folk and classical traditions then prevalent in the society. Notch represented cultural interaction between the native and early English settlers in India. Its professional exponent, the Notch girl, held the white sahib spellbound for nearly two centuries. Delicate in person, soft in her features, perfect in form, she captivated the hearts of ordinary Englishmen by her grace and charm and enthralled the more sophisticated among them by her conversation, wit and enraptured the elite with her notch which some have found superior to all the operas in the world. Professional notch girls and their performances have been described in numerous journals, travelogues, memoirs and diaries left by European visitors, missionaries and civil and military officials. The fare provided by notch girls fascinated most viewers and many a sahib was captivated by their seductive charm. The post place British Nawabs who had made quick fortunes emulated the ostentatious lifestyle of native princes and omrahs. They even maintained their own troops of notch girls and musicians for the entertainment of their guests. A dinner in the community was usually followed by a notch performance. So were other festive occasions such as the celebration of a king emperor's birthday and visits of dignitaries to civil and military stations. Notch girls would also accompany the British army whenever it was on the move, entertaining the soldiers on the way. At times, they were also engaged to welcome arriving guests on the highways. An army officer in his journal in 1783 states, he was met by his friend Major McNeil, who was preceded by a troop of Notch girls. The latter encircled his palanquin dancing until he entered the major's house in Arcot. Notch girls catered to a mixed society, but it was men who got into the spirit of the Notch. Encouraged by the men's applause of wah wah, they would shed off their stiff reserve cool propriety, displaying their seductive charms. James Forbes, in his Oriental Memoirs, 1813, pays this compliment to Notch girls. They are extremely delicate in their person, soft and regular in their features, with a form of perfect symmetry, and although dedicated from infancy to this profession, they in general preserve a decency and modesty in the demeanor, which is more likely to allure than the shameless effrontery of similar characters in other countries. The quality of the notch and the class of notch girls varied from place to place as did the reactions of the British spectators. In an early 19th century account, Captain Mundy describes a splendid notch party held in honour of the commander-in-chief by the company's political agent, Captain Wade, in Ludhiana, where 46 notch girls entertained the guests, only to be surpassed by the British resident at Delhi, who honoured the commander-in-chief with a performance by Notch girls numbering 100. The Notch became a common form of entertainment in the mansions of the English merchants turned rulers in Bengal and other parts of India. The immense popularity of the Notch can be judged by the fact that at times a dance performance would begin in the evening and last until daybreak. Among the prominent and most colourful British residents of Delhi at that time were Colonel James Skinner, known as Sikandar Saheb, and Sir David Okta Noli, nicknamed Looney Akta, who lived in royal style and held lavish notch parties to entertain the English community. Colonel Skinner, a great patron of Delhi artists, would give away miniature paintings of notch girls to his guests, sometimes of the very same dancer who were entertaining them. One finds that one of the most popular numbers in the repertoire of Notch Girl was the Kaharka Notch or Kuharwa, the bearer's dance, 
usually performed before a male audience. Another popular number considered graceful was the kite dance performed to the rhythm of a slow and expressive melody. The dancers would initiate and imitate their gestures, the movements of a person flying a kite. The dances performed by the Notch girls were simple. They did not follow any one classical style, but borrowed liberally from three dance traditions, Kathak, Dasiatam and folk. The Kathak of early 19th century was simple. The repertoire of Toras and Tukras was limited and primary focus was on storytelling. Kathak had not yet been transformed into an elaborate school of dance by Bindadin Maharaj and Kalka Prasad Maharaj. It was aesthetically pleasing and elegant but not intricate and complex. Dasi Atam was more complex but lent itself easily to use in the popular dance of Notch girls. Folk dances added a charming and local flavor to the Notch. It was up to the Notch girls to masterfully incorporate elements of all three styles of dance into their performances. The Morka Natch, Dance of the Peacock, Patang Natch, the Kite Dance, and the Kaharka Natch, the Bearer's Dance, were considered essential items in every Notch girl's repertoire. In South India, the dance tradition continued to be associated with the temple. While Kathak flourished in North India, the Asiatam, also referred to as Sadir Natch, dominated the Notch scene in the South. It was far more than mere visible expression of a sung melody. It had a life of its own with a direct appeal to emotions. Often the dance was in itself the pantomime of a whole story. Dr. John Shaw, in his account of Dancing Girls of South India in 1870, noted that their dance movements were marked by agility, case and gracefulness, and the turning and twisting of the hands, eyes, face, features and trunk were in complete harmony with their nimble steps whilst they beat time with their feet. Their dance was more feminine and suited to solo performances in temples and later in a court and at other public functions. There were greater emphasis on pure dance and abhinaya or expressions as they recited songs which were generally in praise of the gods but could also be interpreted in human terms for the benefit of their patrons. The songs of Notch Girls had as their themes either the amorous escapades in the lives of gods or conventional romantic tales, usually about the lovers yearning for the beloved. Until the end of the 19th century, songs in Persian were as popular as those in Hindustani. The one Persian ghazal by Hafiz, which dominated the Notch scene for over a hundred years and invariably evoked roaring applause both from the natives and from the European, was Taza Ba Taza Nu Ba Nu, fresh and fresh, new and new, a mirthful melody in which the poet recommends applying the principles of fresh and new to all he does, whether in drinking, making friends or making love. This finds mention in numerous foreign accounts of the Notch. There are even references comparing the singing style and the rendering of this ghazal by different reputed Notch girls of the day. When a Notch girl addressed a patron with whom she had a liaison, the song would convey a meaningful message to him. Notch dancers were quasi-servants of British masters too, who often used and then abused their services. Some famous Notch dancers were Umrao Jan, Mallika Hassan, Anarkali, and the spy called Mata Hari. Notch dance also got popularized when early Western travelers and dancers came and found it very exotic. Artists like Ruth St. Denis and Pavlova and others made short items called Notch dance, and they swirled and twirled in circles, emulating Kathak dancers of the times. Ruth St. Denis created the East Indian Notch dance around 1932. She took basic movements from the street dancers in Coney Island in New York State and adapted them into her own complex choreography with whirling arms, drumming feet and swishing skirts. She developed a style and variety of notch dances with different costumes and themes and they were popular not only in America and Europe but in India as well. 
As the 19th century wore on, the spread of English education brought in a new petty bourgeois class which, influenced by Western ideas, got alienated from the art and cultural traditions of the country. This educated group was also swayed by the writings of some foreign observers who, without understanding the origin and nature of Indian dance and mistaking it for a representation of erotic temple sculptures, condemned it as repulsive and immoral. They made no distinction between an accomplished professional notch girl or a devdasi and a common prostitute, dubbing both as fallen women. In the drive against Notch, the missionaries were also joined by a powerful group of educated Indian social reformers who, influenced by Western ideas and Victorian moral values, had lost pride in their own cultural heritage.